Okay. Yep. Can I see it? So we should be out. There we are. Yep. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm I'm really quite honoured and excited to be part of the conversations this afternoon, and um, I'm hoping that I might um, ease everyone back into the uh, post post lunch break. There's probably something hopefully that's probably a little bit less technical uh, than where most of you are. Uh, I wouldn't call myself a, a data scientist at all, um, but I, I sit in a really interesting space um, across a number of organisations uh, involved in place naming. So I had a little bit of difficulty with that uh, <laughs> with that Mentimeter, I must say, Steve, and uh, I probably uh, quite a few tick boxes in there on my part, and I'll explain a little bit of that context uh, in a moment. Um, I think as it says up here, I'm really, I'm here today to just share some examples around place names and vocabulary use uh, across Australia uh, and some of the work that's happening in that space. Um, but, and, and this is going to come from, um, I guess, my perspective across um, having roles in a number of different organisations, um, and they all have a bit of a bearing on, on the, the place names and, and vocabulary sort of overlap there. So, um, before I jump into some specifics for Australia, though, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of that context. I'm actually going to jump back a little bit into some, some international context just to help you all understand a little bit, not just where I'm coming from this afternoon, uh, but also, I, I guess, the organisations and people involved in, in place naming and the vocabs as well. So at the global level, um, we start with a UN group of experts on geographical names. And I thought the easiest way for me to explain uh, what that group is about is to show you their vision. Uh, which is that rather rather big mouthful of words that you've got on the screen there. Um, most, most probably relevant to the conversations this afternoon is the, the second half that I've put in bold. Uh, and it's really about having place names easily accessible for national and international use, uh, which of course facilitates the consistent worldwide use of geographical names to foster communication and cooperation. So I think that fits really, really nicely with um, the concepts of vocabularies and and the work that we're trying to do. This group uh, in Ungarian, it's probably only really a few years ago, we start talking about linked open data. Uh, we very quickly acknowledged that it was sort of that next stage in a bit of a technical development for us and understanding that, that, that we needed to, to start to learn a little bit about what this meant. Uh, most recently, we hosted a webinar uh, and we had some really interesting presenters um, from overseas. There's actually some from Norway, the Netherlands and Germany, and actually demonstrating some really good working implementations of linked open data that we're using, using place name vocabularies. Um, the, the link is actually on the, the bottom of the, the screen though. So if you do wanna take a look at that, um, please do. I think the preference though for our group is not to upskill ourselves into whole data science space. Um, we, we really wanna encourage collaborations um, between national naming authorities and sort of linked data practitioners at that, that national and regional level. So um, thank you, Steve, and all the other organizers today <laughs> for helping, uh, helping me in, in that little part. Um, at an Australian level, um, we, we don't really have a, a genuine, a single national names authority. We've actually got a couple that work together to do um, that job. So some of you might be familiar with the Australian New Zealand Working Group on, on place names. Um, that's where the, the Composite Gazetteer Australia comes from or the Geoscience Australia Gazetteer, if any of you have used that um, and are familiar with that. Um, it's also really, it's effectively a, a, a collection of all the, the state and territory and, and Commonwealth naming authorities, so the government naming authorities across Australia and New Zealand, um, and they come together to make decisions around what place names are going to be, so those official place names, and they also maintain those jurisdictional data sets. So it's a really a bit of a focus on that, that sort of decision making, that authoritative kind of section of things. Um, if we consider that working group on place names to be governmental or intergovernmental, um, the Australian National Place Name Survey, which is the ANPS one, is probably by comparison, sits more in the academic space and, and the research space. It's a long running project um, to study and record the origin, the meaning uh, and the motivation behind Australia's place names, past and present. Um, it was actually initiated um, by Australian Academy of Humanities uh, quite a number of years ago. 
Um, but these days it actually sits as a, a not-for-profit. I think like a lot of things, struggled a little bit with funding. Uh, so it's actually housed now. There's that place named Australia, which probably no one has heard of, even though it's got a really handy name for us, um, is actually a, a not-for-profit. Um, so that project and all that research in that space actually continues today um, with the support of a really small group of volunteer researchers, mostly retired academics, which we're very grateful for. Uh, if anyone's used the TLC map, the Time Laid, -laid Culture Map of Australia, um, the gazetteer that's behind that, that's the data that comes from, from this group here. Uh, and finally, um, down the bottom, and, and as Megan mentioned, my, my day job <laughs> when I'm not down here having a chat to you guys or, or doing any of this other stuff is with the Queensland Government. Um, so we're one of those principal government naming authorities that, that come together under that working group of place names. Um, and Queensland and the other states and territories as well work in various capacities with that Australian, um, Australian National Place Names Survey um, to share research across the sort of cultural aspects of names. So I think the, the purpose of trying to explain a little bit of that, I think, is that it's to show that it's really quite a, an interconnected, if not uh, very well known, uh, network of naming in Australia. And that in itself can make data or vocabulary creation and reuse quite challenging. Uh, we've heard similar stories from a lot of people today. I think what's a little bit different about naming is that we're actually a very small community. Um, so we may actually have <laughs> a little bit uh, of hope, um, perhaps, in getting on top of some of these things before they they get too far away from us. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'll just give you that. Yep. And we'll one second. We'll just switch. Okay. All right. Uh, is that okay if I get here? Coming through okay. Okay, well, I'm sure someone will um, put something in the chat if it's uh, not working for us. Yeah, thanks very much. All right, so I'll jump now into some of the examples that I wanted to share. And there are probably a lot that I could have talked about in this space, but I've, I've chosen just three for you today. Um, the first one I want to talk about place types. And we would had a bit of a conversation briefly, I think, in an earlier one about feature types. Um, so th there's a little bit of an overlap there and a little bit of a space in there. Um, when we talk about place names, um, it's a very, very broad term. We very rarely talk about it um, quite so broadly. We talk about things like hills and beaches and roads and towns and, and that type of thing. So um, our place names data is, is similarly categorised um, based on the types uh, of places. And I should talk, I'm talking now really around that context of what the states and territories in Australia are doing and the data that then comes together um, to actually create a national gazetteer. Because you can see by the map there, we've got a whole bunch of states and territories. We've got some wet area, we've got external territories, and we've also got uh, Antarctic territory down there as well. Um, each one of them has a different data set. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a challenge to try and create a national product, uh, not only for our own purposes, but for anyone else to use for anything at all. The problem, uh, we had a bit of a problem with this in that um, actually mashing all of that data was together was a manual process. Uh, so there was a person sitting in Geoscience Australia, if you're lucky then, uh, who had to source all of that data from the various uh, jurisdictional databases, um, do some kind of interpretation uh, and, and join it all together somehow to create a, a product. And it was taking about two years to create a national data set. And that was sort of cycling through all the time. Um, so we had 10 da data sets. Of course, that means we had 10, <laughs> 10 different uh, sets of data types, uh, sorry, place types. Um, they weren't all completely wrong. We, did, we had had a national model for some time, a national vocabulary. It's just over the years that it sort of uh, diverged a little bit. So it was pretty similar, uh, but it's just not, not identical. Um, they'd evolved a little bit. And of course, there was a whole lot of variability interpretation because you had humans on the data creation end, sometimes putting place names into to certain categories. And then you had this person sitting in Joyce Science Australia trying to mash them all together and, and sometimes putting them into different ones again. So it was a little bit uh, a challenging. This all came to a head. Uh, we knew it wasn't great. But it, it kind of kept going because, um, as is usually the case, the people who were creating the data and creating the problem weren't the ones trying to join it. Um, so things kind of kept going along. Uh, and really what happened one day is the, the person who was sitting in Geoscience Australia doing all this work retired uh, and his team, when they went to re, re sort of distribute all that work, went, mm, uh, no, 
we're not doing this anymore uh, and basically said to the states and territories you guys got to put your heads together and come up with a, a, a vocabulary and some similar types so that we can just automatically do this um, so that was our solution we basically decided we're going to agree to a, um, a national vocabulary everyone was going to supply data using that uh, and we had this bit of an idea that there was probably a fair bit of overlap with topographic data and existing feature types there was a whole range of different um, different vocabs within that discipline and within government already uh, and we kind of mashed all those to, together uh, to try and create a, a more modern one that worked for us without taking a huge deviation from our existing previous national model so off we set um very very low tech approach here very different to probably some of the the um the things that you used to we literally did some whiteboarding we we had a bit of some good ideas and then we sat around a, a laptop and created a bit of an excel spreadsheet so this is as simple as it needs to be and from a subject matter expertise within the discipline uh we we don't have any data you know the big data skills that that many of you guys do so uh this is where we got to um and it was actually it was actually quite reasonably effective um what we ended up with in that green column there is is what ultimately became the place types and you can see they each had definitions um we didn't know anything about linked data we didn't know anything about vocabularies uh, by pure chance though we did a few helpful things uh, through this journey um the the green column there it used to be two to four letter codes in the past we had hundreds and hundreds of things um, and so we decided this time around we're going to do away with codes there wasn't limitations in in data storage like there was in the past and it was hard for us to remember and look up extra code lists and things like that i think you talked about some of that stuff before so and so uh, we got rid of those and decided to use whole words that a regular human probably had a pretty good you know handle on on what they might actually be uh, we also created um, about, we created three different tiers. So you can see we've got on the far left, we've got different groups um, and categories, uh, and then all the, the features or the place types belong to those. Uh, our thinking there was that that was a little bit of just human logic. And we're also looking at ways to be able to provide different types of um, grouped products for people so if they wanted to look at you know all the undersea features which a particular organization might want to do it was all it was all in there together um, and we also actually reused some existing vocabularies so for example I mentioned the undersea uh, features there um, we didn't go down the path of trying to define all sorts of different place types for undersea we just have fully adopted um, there's an international standing committee on undersea feature names um, so we just fully adopted their vocabulary and slotted it into our our spreadsheet there so I've learned since then that some of those things are, are probably um, were probably pretty helpful um, it worked for our purposes um, so the spreadsheet was agreed to we came up with all of that uh, it was sent off the data supply you know states and territories went off and sorted out their data geoscience Australia built some new infrastructure um, they put a, a cloud-based repository with a GUI front end so that um, the state governments could load their own data. Um, they built some scripts and FME behind the scenes that joined all those data sets together based on the feature types or the, the place types, sorry, that we created. Um, and then they built this new portal, which is what you can see on the screen there. And you can see our, our place types and that, that sort of three-tier structure there is working through in the filter as, as well. Um, so we were happy with that. That got our our national data back up again, and people could use could use that um, again. We didn't really know much about this, as I said already. Um, but meanwhile, um, there was a lot happening around LOCI and uh, Australian Government Link Data Working Group, and of course, Geoscience Australia people. And I think there's a bunch of them online uh, at the moment. Um, were, were working on this as well and they went you beauty we've got a, a national data set and a national vocabulary for place names which is quite fundamental to a lot of the other stuff that that we need to do so they went off and did their 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 thing um, and we've now got um, our um, humble little spreadsheet that we've all agreed to at state and territory level um, sitting up there in the research vocabs Australia so um, very low tech but I would say reasonably successful um, sort of situation that we ended up uh, with there. So, so that's great. We've now got this data there. The second example I want to go into is well, what's next? Um, so we've now got this 
what is really still a very simplistic data set. Um, we don't have any status types. Um, so these are things like, is the name official or unofficial? Is it local? Is it indigenous? Um, is, it, is it a dual name? So all these terms that you're probably familiar with, uh, none of those were able to be sort of um, be able to classify guide at this point. Uh, we also obviously only had current data in there. So there's a lot of people wanted to wanted to know what the historical data was. Uh, then we start thinking about, well, what about proposed names and all sorts of things. All this information sits in the state and territory data sets. So it's there, uh, but it was just a case that it wasn't able to be able to easily get up into this, um, into this, this sort of space. So we had a similar problem, starts to look very, very familiar. So we had our 10 data sets again, we've got all these 10 different types and things like that. Um, so a very similar situation to what we had um, before. Um, and what was different here what was a little bit interesting is there's generally actually no currency type. So there was this sort of blended bit of um, status sort of stuff. And I've, I've given in that sort of mess on the screen there, these are just screenshots from four different examples of the status types from some of the state and territory data sets. Um, so you can see there's a whole mismatch of approaches. Um, you have to have a fairly good handle on how those jurisdictions work, what their legislation is, uh, how their data has been managed and all of that sort of stuff to really start to make a little bit of sense of that. We haven't broached this yet. It is the next step in actually being able to create a useful national product for Australia in naming. Um, but this is just something that I've sort of started to have a bit of a play around with. Um, so the solution for this one, is it the same as what we did in place types? Do we just get together again and go down that same path? Look, it could be a little bit simpler, simple. Are similar, but I, I hope not. I think, you know, a few years down the track, we know a lot more now about fair vocabularies. We've got a whole, a whole room and a whole cyberspace full of, full of experts that can probably help us approach this in a perhaps a, a smarter way than what we have done before and actually combine the subject matter knowledge from, from our group and our people around some of those real specifics and actually um, bring that, that forward a little bit more. Um, I'm probably running a little bit yeah, short on time. So I'm just going to wrap up really finally with just one final example. And I, this one was important. I wanted to show you because it's sort of flips things around and puts things on, on completely the other other side of things. Because a lot of the problems we have at the moment is we've got multiple data sets with, with multiple um, different types of vocabularies. Here we've got something that we don't really have a lot of data for yet, but we arguably have a vocabulary. So what you're looking at there is uh, um, basically a uh, a taxonomy that that starts to classify the motivations of naming. Now, this is not really so much into the government space, but into that um, national place name survey space. Um, and this is the core, this is bread and butter of their work is really understanding the motivations behind different names. And if you've been paying attention to the world, uh, <laughs> this is a really interesting space for a lot of people uh, at the moment. People are starting to ask, well, how many names um, are named after people? Um, and of those, are they of good standing? Um, so if we can just think about things that are happening in like Black Lives Matters movements, um, gender equality, inclusion, diversity, all that type of thing, people are asking a lot of questions um, around this sort of stuff. Um, government authorities are starting to tag their data or, or put different categories in their data around how to record this. So they're having to put tick boxes if a, if a place has been named after a woman. Uh, so they can start to do gender equality um, statistics and things like that. So we are at the beginning of that proliferation, yet we have researchers from this, this group here that have actually started already to do some of this work. So this was just an example I wanted to show, and I guess these are the questions that I put to groups like this. Are there vocabularies like this that are already out there that we can start to actually publish in a fair way, which might help prevent proliferation uh, of of this sort of these kind of things and different those different vocabularies in the future. Um, so look, just a whole bunch of food for thought. Um, I won't go into that because I think I'm probably a little bit short on time, and I, I want to let um, Megan sort of move forward. But you know, I could probably fill a whole bunch of this. I think the thing that keeps coming back to me time and time again is the importance of connecting people and finding the right people and the organisations to connect together. This is not a data issue. It's not purely a technical issue. Uh, it's really a lot about people in that space. Um, a lot of the work we've been been doing has been about building vocabs and, and ontologies or models 
models around data sets and those data sets are often really simplistic. They don't really represent the real world. Um, so I think there's scope for us to start to shift some of this thinking into actually modeling real world concepts or things like that. So we can actually start to shift away from that and, and not actually have people continue to reuse the same old data that actually doesn't quite, quite do the job. Um, from my perspective, I think there's a lot of non-data benefits for subject matter experts. Some of the stuff I'm talking about here and some of these terms that need to be defined for data also exist in legislation. They define who has the power to make certain decisions and things like that. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, value, I think, for us to start be talking about outside of that space as well. There's obviously all the new, all the maintenance issues. I won't go into that. I think this group is, is probably well aware of all the challenges around that. But I guess my final question coming from the perspective that I do is, is how can builders of fair vocabs, which is a lot of you here, um, help guide how often some of these unfair vocabs or, or people like myself and the organisations that I represent uh, do our work in a way that doesn't proliferate the same issues all the time on the at the end of the journey uh, in that sense. So I'm just connecting that. So I might leave it there, Megan, and um, we'll go from there.